Do you know what a podcaster is? Troby is a podcaster. So is Lisa. Not forgetting Warren. And Paul. And Nick. There are all sorts of podcasters. Some who like I, Claudius. And some who like Yes, my dear. Years ago, people used to believe that podcasters had magic powers. Some people believe it still. But then some people will believe any old rubbish. I know a special podcast, but to make it play, you have to say the magic word. Archivacious. Gentlemen and ladies, with neatly trimmed gardens, but the occasional troublesome weed, it's episode 13 of Round the R. Chives! <laughs> on BBC One in a moment tomorrow's world and at 7.20 Top of the Pops includes the Bay City Rollers Lulu the Average White Band Cliff Richard the Goodies and Guys and Dolls Top of the Pops is followed at 8 o'clock by Are You Being Served Mr. Lucas attempts to go sick You're normal Yes but we're working on it (laughs) Programmes tonight on BBC One Hello. Hello. I'm Andrew. I'm Lisa. Welcome to episode 13 of Round the Archives. Not Round the Archives. Not Round the Archives, which, which is, is an awful, really joke. awful joke. But we're doing Sorry. the herbs. And I wanted to do that joke. Okay. Right. What do we have left over from last time? Um, BBC one, Blankets. BBC Blankets. Yes, the BBC Blanket pops up in um, the Brian Cant Hunt for Black Jack thing. Mm-hmm. Um, just want to mention that out. We think they might well pop up in the changes. because well, we it, can't find the book to find out. Well, there seems to be a photo of her wrapped in a BBC blanket in that. But uh, mm. yes, there we go. Uh, but more importantly, um, hello to Australia. Yes, hello, Australia. Uh, for I hope you know what you let yourself in for. Yes, hello, Australia. Hello, Australia. Hello. That's what Tom Baker used oh, to right, say. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Australia then said hello oh, back, did it? for okay. some reason. That's nice. Um, Yes, we've got some listeners in Australia, so mm-hmm. hello to you. Welcome. Possibly due to all the publicity we had for last episode. Yes. For which we have to thank uh, mm. Derek Griffiths. Yes. Ian Cullen. Yes. And John Chalice. John Chalice. For giving us um, lots of, lots of lovely, and lovely publicity for last yes. time. And, uh, the Derek Griffiths one sort of doubled the listening it figures did. within an hour. Within it, was, an hour it was remarkable. Yes, it was so thank you, thank you especially to. Yes to Derek yes, and and Mr Chalice will be popping up later yes we, we in do. this issue issue yes um, Mistress of Hardwick we should say about that though because yes. we were talking about Bess of Hardwick we to were. do with connections yes and Mistress of Hardwick was a uh, series from 1972 mm-hmm. about Bess of Hardwick surprisingly um, very much forgotten I think these days as yeah. uh, nine of the ten episodes are missing so yes. So you don't. There's not much of it to see. No. Uh, but it was directed by Rodney Bennett, mm-hmm. written by Alison Plowden, mm-hmm. and starred Hilary Mason as Bess. Okay. So, it's, sounds interesting anyway. Right. But uh, okay. yeah, there you go. There's, there's its listing on IMDb. Right. But um, let's let's crack on with the first article, shall we? I think yes. that's that's it for odds and ends. Mm-hmm. Um, so Michael Bond. Yes. Michael Bond. Michael Bond, who passed away recently. Yes. Um, and who is mostly known for Paddington. Yes. But also did The Herbs. Yes. And The Adventures of Parsley. Yes. And wrote books. Um, Olga de Polga. Olga de Polga. Who um, the, uh, I think she's a guinea pig. Guinea pig. <laughs> and, I don't know. I've not read And them. Mr. Pamplemousse, who I assumed was a mouse, but seems to be a detective with a bloodhound. A bloodhound called Pom Frit, apparently. Okay. A cu- these are culinary mystery stories for adults. Okay. So, there you go. I now I don't know these at all. No. I have um, to investigate those. Yes, but yes, I mean we've we sort of talked about Michael Bond in in the Paddington episode article. two because yes. you talked about your love of Paddington. Yes. But did you just want to recap yeah, that I, a bit? I just 
you know, as, as I I said um, on social media when when I, it was announced he died, I'd like to thank Michael Bond because he's he. The Paddington books were the first books after I'd learned to read and I did all the Janet and John books and all those sort of things. Mm-hmm. The Paddington books were the first books I read. Yeah. And that has given me a love of reading and a particular love of Paddington. And it's all down to Michael Bond. Yeah. He's, he's given people, he's given me certainly hours and hours of entertainment yes. and joy. And I love Paddington, as we said in, in you know, the previous article. I identify with Paddington <laughs> because he's very well-meaning, but he gets things wrong. Yes, and if everybody was like that, then the world might be a better place. I mean, yes, I'm very fond of Paddington too, but uh, this time round, uh, to remember Michael, I th- I wanted to do the herbs, the herbs instead, yeah. um, mm-hmm. which is it's so from nineteen uh, it's from nineteen sixty eight, um, and so am I. Right. <laughs> so I feel I feel an immediate sort of association. Mm-hmm. with the herbs um but I, I think it's sometimes sort of overlooked and, and yes. the adventures of parsley especially is very much overlooked yes um yes. and that ran for 32 Episode. episodes mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. you wouldn't have thought there was that much they could do about a lying and his dog friend <laughs> but yeah the, the herbs the first episode is from february 1968 uh one thirty in the afternoon in the watch with mother slot so this is monday the 12th of february um if you want your sort of doctor who road map um mm-hmm. the web of fear episode two was transmitted on the previous saturday so okay. there you go um but yeah the the actual um bbc um radio times listing for it has got a big picture of uh, Sir Basil and Lady Rosemary, Lady Rosemary yes. and we'll explain about them in a minute. But it mm-hmm. just says introducing the herbs. Uh, see if I can read that. I've got it's very small. Uh, this afternoon, children can watch with mother the first of thirteen puppet stories based on a story by Michael Bond, well known for his books about Paddington the Bear. The stories take place in a herb garden. Its owners are Sir Basil and his wife, Lady Rosemary, brackets above. Their gardener is called Bayleaf, and law and order is kept by Constable Knapweed. But the most important person, that's got capital letters Mm -hmm. for all of those words, in the garden is a lion called Parsley. He doesn't happen to be very brave, and he has a tail made of parsley. Which is why it's called Parsley, (laughs) certainly. Well, that's logical, if nothing else. (laughs) Yes, but... um, how do we explain this series? It's it's another one that's slightly strange, isn't it? Yes. Um, yes. But it's, it's it's got a slightly more. Um, it's more sort of fantasy based yeah. than Paddington, because yeah. Paddington, apart from Paddington himself, Everybody is very else much is, is human. It's very much based yes. in sort of real life, real isn't life. it? You know, real life. Probably like there's a bear living in a house. Yeah, yeah. yeah but apart mm. apart from that, everybody's sort of quite yeah. realistic characters. Yeah. In the herbs, everyone's a. Uh, a fantasy character mm-hmm. as as their name implies they are mm. literally her- her- well i don't know how it works because they are herbs but they live in a herb garden but There's a herb garden. they're animals and human beings yes. at the same time so yeah. but parsley is a lion mm-hmm. but his tail is a sprig of parsley, parsley and yeah. when it gets mm-hmm. shot off in the first they episode can they can again. stick it back on and it regrows yeah. so don't even ask me about the biology of, of, the, of the herbs. I think you can worry about that sort of thing too much. Just accept it. <laughs> but um, it, it, Michael Bond sort of came up with this um, series and apparently consulted uh, Cole Pepper's Complete Herbal Book, mm-hmm. which is a book from the 17th century uh, written by Nicholas, Nicholas Culpepper, Culpepper. Mm-hmm. Um available as a Wordsworth reference and, classic and in book other formats as and well. other formats as well mm-hmm. but we we got that mm-hmm. and i sort of look i i got i got the book uh, or rather you you got the book mm. and although it's quite a thick book and it goes into all sorts of sort of herbs that i've never even heard of mm. I, I did wonder how much use it actually was when michael bond came to sort of research the characters 
Um, if you'll just hold the recorder a minute, Lisa, just hold it at the bottom there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just wave it in my general direction. Okay. Here, here's the book. And for example, uh, Dill. Because Dill, the dog, mm. it was a dog called Dill. It was a dog called Dill, is in the in the series itself. But Cole Pepper says, um, Mercury has the dominion of this plant, and therefore it is, t therefore to be sure, it strengthens the brain. The dill being, being boiled and drank is good to ease swellings and pain. It also stays the belly and stomach from casting. Uh, the decoction therefore helps women that are troubled with the pains and windiness of the mother if they if they sit therein. It stays the hiccup being boiled in wine but smelled unto being tied in the cloth. How on earth you get a character of all that? Stuff. stuff i really i really but, don't because know there are some some um uh bits where it just says things like rosemary well everybody knows what this is that's oh, yeah, not oh, helpful oh yes it is it, is wonderful sort of mm. descriptions of of parsley mm. this is so well known it needs no description and then he goes on to a great big description um it is under the dominion of Mercury, is very comfortable to the stomach, helps to provo provoke urine and women's courses to break wind both in the stomach and bowels. Right. <laughs> so, there's not much sign of that in Parsley. No, the, fortunately. The actual, the, actual, um, the actual character, thank goodness. There was one that I, I did laugh at, though, and that was, mm. that, that was Plums. Plums. Because we, we, look, we looked at Plums and it just made me laugh. Mm. Here we are. Uh, just hand that back. Thank you. Plums are so well known that they need no description. All plums are under Venus and are like women, some better and some worse. There you go. That's what you're dealing with in the 17th yes, century. Well, yeah. 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 Okay. Bearing in mind they'd had a, two queens by that point. Yeah. But the main characters of the herbs, as we said, it's set in a herb garden, it's animation, mm -hmm. uh, parsley. It's not a cartoon, though. It, it's, no, it's stop um, motion. Stop, stop motion. motion. You should, you so, should specify so, yeah, that. Stop there motion people, puppets. There may be people listening who have never seen And this. they're quite big puppets, actually. Yeah. And we'll get yeah. on to how we know that in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, Parsley the lion is the, is the main one. Mm -hmm. And he's the one... Um, sort of that sort of welcomes you into the yes, herb garden. You interact with him. Yeah. Right. Now the first episode, Parsley's Tale. We just watched mm. it back, yeah. and it's an interesting setup because it seems to be that the animal characters can see you, mm -hmm. the viewer at home, because you have to wave yeah, to Parsley. Wave to Parsley to convince him you're not scary. Yeah, because the Parsley's first time scared of everything. The first time Parsley sees the viewers, he mm. sort of goes he and hides behind a bush. Mm keeps on peeping out and you mm. you said he's a bit like martha our cat yes in that she's scared by unexpected things yeah, like, so, feet. like slippers yeah and, and feet and a tail and her own tail <laughs> yes martha will jump at anything mm. and parsley is very similar yes. now this sort of i think sums up michael michael bond's sort mm -hmm. of approach to these characters yeah. that that you know, as Warren said many issues ago about um, fierce animals appearing in in children's fiction, mm. that Paddington is a bear, mm. but he's very polite yes. and always raises his hat. If he's got a hat, uh, the the worst you get out of Paddington is a hard stare. Yeah, and, and maybe some yeah. stickiness for yeah. marmalade. Parsley um, is is easily spooked. Yes, he will roar occasionally, but that's usually to warn somebody or something. Yeah. It's uh, not aggressive. It's yeah. to warn that there's danger. Yeah. So it, it's that thing about all, all all these animals are quite gentle yes. and nice. Yes. Um, so you've got Parsley design. You've got mm -hmm. Dill the dog, Dill who's the dog. who's always running around. He's hyperactive. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sage the owl, who's mm -hmm. a bit grumpy, but very sweet. Yeah. <laughs> I like Sage. Sir Basil, Lady Rosemary, Constable Natweed, Bayleaf the gardener, and a few slightly lesser seen characters. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. and Mrs. Onion. Mrs. Onion's always crying. Okay, so it's like she's allergic to herself. Yeah, it's, it's like her own head causes her to cry. Yeah. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Yes. Onion and the Chives. Who are their children? Who are their, their children? They Although, might be adopted. Yeah, because onions wouldn't have chives as children. No, surely onions, onions would, have would onions just have onions. onions as children. <laughs> chives are slightly different, yeah. but um, they're part of the same family. I should. But the chives are quite sinister as yes. they sort of march along. Yeah, it's like. There's too many of them, and they just they don't they don't have expressions, and they're a bit mm. scary. Um, <laughs> but weirdly, they're 
they're sort of marching along and they've got feet. Mm. But when a chive grows, the mm. bulbous bit is in the ground. So right. effectively, they're walking around upside down. Okay. Uh, I don't know. There's Aunt Mint. Mm-hmm. Well, there's Terrigan the dragon. Terrigan you like the, him, I don't like you? Terrigan the dragon. Yeah. He's like a little cat. Yeah, he, sort he sets of, fire. To he stuff. breathes. He breathes fire. Um, he mostly sets fire to Constable Natweed's notebook. notebook yes. Um, he he's got a bit of a speech impediment as well. Yeah, it's he, unfortunate because he can't say his R's. Yeah, he, he's and, so, yeah because everybody's got a song and yeah. his his song is "I'm Tower Gun the Dragon." Is the first <laughs> is the Which first is line quite sweet, really? Yeah, yeah. and there's a, there's a few um, other sort of characters there's Pashana Bedi who's an Indian charmer. snake charmer and he's got a snake as well he's, which is a really funny snake because yeah. it escapes in one episode but it doesn't try and bite in the bone there's one bit where Bailey's carrying it around on his arm yeah. and all it does is hold, is hang on to a basket yeah because it doesn't want to go yeah it doesn't, it doesn't try and bite him or anything I don't know what kind of snake it is there's Good King Henry mm. now he's quite interesting because yes. um, he's teamed up with Miss Jessup mm-hmm. who's who's a bit annoying and mm. wants to tidy up all the time yes yeah. Um, and upright Miss Jessup is another name for Rosemary. All right, okay, thank you for that. Uh, but they want to give her a husband just to yes, stop her being to stop annoying. Her from tidying up and they're going to Bayleaf's going to Bayleaf's been gonna, told he's going to have to marry her, and he's go, oh no, I don't want to do that. So he goes off and grows. Good King Henry. King, King Henry sort of plants some seeds, yeah. and it grows and, and, immediately. And Good King Henry just appears. Yes. So this seems to be how the herb garden. Yeah works um now sir basil earlier claims to be because uh, his song goes i am sir basil the king of the herbs yes and i think that's just in his head his own head really because yeah. well, i think it, what it is is he just because i'm just looking at the description of sir basil on the wikipedia page which mm. obviously you have to take it with a pinch of salt because it's wikipedia yeah but it says a bumbling aristocratic hunting shooting a fishing type with an almost red nose perhaps to, to suggest a drinking problem he described himself as the king of the herbs, the Greek name for basil being, there's something Greek, or royal plant. All oh, right, okay. So basil means royal plant, so that's why he's the king but of the herbs. But if he's a sir, yeah. where did he get his knighthood he from? He gave himself it. He's the king of the herbs, he can do what he yeah. likes. I don't know. No. Uh, uh, Belladonna the witch. Yes. Oh, she's, she's quite scary. She is. Um, yes. She's got a big hooked nose. And she's got a big pointy witch's hat. Now, of when, course. When I was very small, mm. and... We used to go for a drive sometimes. Hmm. You'd see all the traffic cones on the motorway, mm-hmm. and we always, uh, our family always used to refer to them as belladonnas, okay, because they were the same shape as her hat. Right. And, and then, then, there's also Senior Solidago as well, who's a he's a singer, Italian opera singer. He tries to teach Sage how to sing. All Sage manages to do is break a load of glass yes. when he's singing, and then he isn't tries it? to see partially how to sing, and, and partially she's just bad. But going back to belladonna. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting fact about Belladonna. Oh, yes. Go that on. in, um, mostly in Tudor times, but from then onwards, yeah. people, well, women, used to put Belladonna, or Deadly Nightshade, as it's also yeah. known, in their eyes to make their eyes look bigger. Yes, because it's... Which is a very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> and could lead to blindness, I would imagine. Uh, yes, use in cosmetics. Um, Belladonna is Italian for beautiful lady, mm. you see. So... Uh, Drops prepared from the belladonna plant are used to dilate women's pupils. Um, an effect considered to be attractive and seductive. Prolonged uses causes blindness. <laughs> <laughs> and it also says a bit mes- medicinal use. Uh, yes. as a They probably pain, used it before they developed other eye drops. Pain reliever, muscle relaxant and anti-inflammatory. Um, though we really don't try this at home. <laughs> we really don't, don't advise that. Yes. But... Um, as with Trumpton, etc., every character's got a song. Yes, haven't they? Yes. Um, and they, they go through a few variants as well. Yeah, they change it to suit what's happening in that particular yeah, episode. Yeah, although um, I'm a very Parsley's one goes. I'm a very friendly line called Parsley, and really the only thing they can rhyme with Parsley is harshly. Yeah, and even that's a bit of a squeeze, a bit of a squeeze. <laughs> to get yeah. that in. Yeah. Um, Bayleaf the gardener. Gets a gets a few because we used to have a well I used to have a parsley annual. All right. Um, and it's it's never this this version's never used in the TV show, but he's making um, Halloween 
lan- lanterns, but he's making them from turnips, not pumpkins. Okay. And Bailey's song in that goes something like, I'm Bailey, I'm the gardener last night at Halloween. I hollered 20 turnips out to light the happy scene. R. Because he always ends the he song ends with, with an R because he's, Cause he comes a, he, from the cause he's a yokel. Yeah. I mean, the, the narrator for the Herbs is Gordon Rawlings. Mm-hmm. Um, possibly not the most famous name in the world. Um, oh, he's, he's probably, if you've seen lots but, of stuff, he's probably been but in he's something. But pr- he's probably one of those people you'd recognise. He plays lots of men. If men men <laughs> at bar. Well, obviously he plays lots of men, but you know what I mean. Men oh, at, yes, man uh, at bar. Superman 3, Man in Cap. Um, yes, but um, his most famous um, sort of part came quite late in his life mm-hmm. when he's in the John Smith's bitter adverts, yeah. playing Art Wright, um, the, the, the old man with the flat cap and the dog. Mm. And I never made the connection no. that, as, as to who he was till, till only very recently. Um, Oh, his dog in the adverts is called Tonto, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So when they came to release a video of um, four episodes of The Herbs, Mm -hmm. um, this must have been in the the 90s, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to check the end end credits. Um, There was a video done which featured... um, Now, who was it? Simon Mayo Mm -hmm. and Sybil... Rusco. Rusco, is that how Rusco, you pronounce yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and they actually go. I'm not entirely sure where it is. It's, it looks like some sort of museum some sort, or something. Yeah, yeah in 1989, um, this this video was done, and they go in. They go to this sort of house somewhere, and all all the puppets are there. Mm. Well, most of them are there, and they're really quite quite big. Yes, I mean, partially is a lot bigger than I expected them to be. Yeah, and they do some actual. At new animation with the puppets and they're in fairly fairly decent nick but by by that point um gordon rollings died in 1985 and this video was done in 1989 so they got charles pemberton uh to do the voices instead mm. um charles pemberton who was a cyberman in tomb of the cyberman mm-hmm. and he's also in uh box of delights yes he's the it? chief constable as the chief constable mm-hmm. yeah and he's the policeman and, in oh he's Saffron in saffron steel, steel story, story one. one that's yeah. right yes um, he keeps disappearing he's he's not bad some some of it some of his are better than others as yeah. we said is 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 partially not bad no. um his tarragon mm-hmm. sounds a bit simple but never mind <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, he has a good old stab at stab at doing that. It was nice just to see some some new new yeah. herb stuff, new animations. Yeah, but it, I mean, it's 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 a I say it's it's a bit odd as as a series goes. It is quite sort of fantasy based, mm-hmm. but then you get the spin off series, the Adventures of Parsley. Yeah, where you've got sort of Parsley and Dill as a bit of a double act, haven't you? Mm-hmm. And I said to you, it's a bit like. Um, uh, Dougal and Brian, and Brian. And fr- from the Magic Roundabout, yeah. in that because um, Brian's always quite up, you mm-hmm. know, he's quite sort of keen, and so's Dill because Dill's always sort of rushing yes. around. And there's, there's one where like Parsley's got a car or something, mm-hmm. and I had that car uh, as a dinky toy, and you got right. Parsley, Aww. a little Parsley in it. It might be in the shed. I'm going to have to go okay. and have a look later. But you, you also got some. Um, Herb's annuals, didn't yes, you? Yes, I did. So, uh, do you like our old annuals? Yeah. Now, th- some of them are very expensive, aren't they? Yes. Well, yeah. I couldn't. I could only find these two. So. Yeah, um, there are some other ones for which you know there's you're paying an awful, awful lot of money. Mm. Um, but I just wanted to read a little bit very quickly. Um, this is one starring Belladonna. Um, I just just read this out. Belladonna, the deadly nightshade, is a witch, and it has always been her vow to bring the rest of the herbs within her power. Although she's tried many times in the past, somehow things have always gone wrong. But when the weather is right, when there is a kind of stillness in the air, with just a hint of thunder in the surrounding hills, you can bet your life Belladonna won't be far away. Mm. Ooh, that's, 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 quite that's, a bit, that's, yeah. that's a bit... That's a bit unexpected mm-hmm. <laughs> just a, just a bit of horror in there you know for the for the kiddies frighten yeah, the kids they love it 
<laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, but yeah, we. I mean, yeah, the series original run is from February to May 1968. But I remember it as a kid. So again, it's one of these series that got repeated forever mm -hmm. and ever and ever. I mean, we've got the uh, the DVD now, thankfully. Um, and I think I think you didn't really know it at all, did you? No, no. not really. No, no. Not but you've so you've much. enjoyed it. I have. Because yeah. you said mm -hmm. it, it's a very inclusive yes. universe, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's notable that in the episode which is um, featuring Pashana Betty, mm -hmm. that after his snake escapes and Lady Rosemary's talking to him, she calls him Mister Betty. Yeah. So, so there's, there's everybody's respectful. very respectful of everybody else, and I think that's really a Michael Bond thing that everybody is equal. Yeah. Everybody's the same. I mean, there there is um, the herbs dot homestead dot com, which is worth a look at, which has got some extra information that we won't we won't go over here really. But there's a lovely little piece um, from um, Michael Bond about the making of the final episode mm. which is Parsley's, uh, birthday party. Parsley's birthday party and that's a that's a sort of five doctors one in that mm. everybody turns up yes. for that so mm. there's a little little piece with everybody there mm -hmm. um and it says um gordon rollings is the only man i've ever met who actually turned up at a studio one morning dead on time as always but wearing an ice pack on his head following what he gloomily called, called a bit of a do the previous night. Uh, the script that day was a complicated one, which was revolved around a surprise birthday party. At the very end, every the inhabitants of the herb garden had to sing happy birthday, each line being rendered in the voice of a different character. Gordon sailed through the script with a minimum of retakes, although at one point the sound engineer complained about strange rattling noises every time he moved his head because of the ice. Mm. <laughs> 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 and that's just that's just a lovely little uh, little piece of info there, but yes, um, I think I think it's it's um, well worth. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, we'd advise you to watch it. Yes, because it's got good stories and a cute, cute lion and dragon. Yeah, a hyperactive dog. <laughs> well, you're always a sucker for cute animals, I am anyway. A sucker for cute animals, yes. yes. Well, there we go. Yeah, um, just just thank you for that, Michael. It's yes. it's you know it's. As I said, I, I love Paddington, but mm -hmm. then I love the herbs as well. And I, yeah. I, I didn't want to sort of forget about the herbs. No, so no. I just wanted to do, do a little piece on it there. Right. <laughs> and now we'll, uh, we've got a, another guest piece mm -hmm. from uh, Mr. Paul Chandler, yes. who's, who's got his jersey on, apparently. Is he? Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah, he's got his jersey on. You see. Right. That's a joke. Okay. You'll get that in a minute. Right. Ta -ra. Bye. businessman goes missing, Jim Bergerac is hot on the trail. Will you go easy through the street? People know him here, respect him, like him. He's a busy man, okay? Do you want him back? Jean Pichet. Pichet Hughes. I put all my money into this partnership, Sergeant. He's destroyed me. So, he's released our men. But who's Jim? Yours or mine? Bergerac, tonight at 8.15 on BBC One. Hello, it's me, Paul the Shy Yeti. Well, this time I wanted to uh, talk to you a bit about one of my favourite shows, um, and that is Bergerac. Yes, a detective show, which ran from the 18th of October 1981 to the 26th of December 1991 it, it was kind of uh, I guess the um, replacement for the show Shoestring with Trevor Eve which was also created by the producer Robert Banks Stewart who uh, also has Doctor Who associations now um, I'm going to kind of rattle through the seasons really and mention some of the uh, 
main characters. Um, the cast sort of does come and go, and um, Bergerac obviously is the main character played by John Nettles, but um, the only other character who's in the every single season of the show is um, Charlie Hungerford played by Terence Alexander who is um, well firstly he's Bergerac's ex-father-in-law but <laughs> I guess they're friends but uh, uh, sometimes it's a bit of an uneasy friendship but uh, um, Charlie Hungerford is probably well I always think of Charlie Hungerford as being a sort of more upper class version of Arthur Daly from Minder his heart is in the right place, but but business is always on his mind. And, uh, yeah, so Bergerac, the series, is largely set in the island, on the island of Jersey, in the Channel Islands, although the series does move about a bit. Um, yeah, there are episodes set in France and, and the UK, most notably London and Bath, but... Uh, what else can I tell you before I move on to specific uh, seasons? Um, there were nine seasons, and there were 87 episodes in all. Now, most of them were 50-minute episodes, but, but certainly at its most popular, there were Christmas specials. Now, there were uh, six of those, and they were, well, they were usually around 90 minutes, sometimes even longer. Each season had between eight to ten episodes, and uh, yeah, in the same way as Doctor Who these days is always shown on Christmas Day. Well, the Christmas specials of Bergerac from 1986 onwards they were shown they were shown on Boxing Day. Um, the one thing that is notable, and the one thing I, I definitely support, is that those Christmas specials. They didn't have to be about Christmas. And that's one thing that sometimes annoys me about modern Doctor Who is that because it's Christmas, it has to be set at Christmas. A typical Western Christmas where it's snow. And I mean, in London, we never get snow at Christmas. You know, why not do an episode set in Australia where it's really sunny? You know, Christmas isn't sunny everywhere, but it is on Doctor Who. But in Bergerac... Um, I don't really remember any of the episodes actually being set at Christmas, particularly not the Christmas specials. They may have been autumnal, but, um, you know, a typical Bergerac Christmas special was just an excuse for a special longer episode of the show, um, presumably filmed at the end of the most recent batch or the start of the next batch, you know, but uh, anyway. Um, so Bergerac, he's the detective, slightly unorthodox, um, he at the start of the series he's recovering from alcoholism and as a result of his drinking he's also he's also recently experienced divorce he has a daughter we sometimes meet the daughter we sometimes meet the ex-wife and at the start of the series he's also just had major surgery on his leg so in in the first season his girlfriend is called Francine Francine Leyland. Now, I apologies if I don't pronounce it right. She's played by Cecile Pauli, and uh, she's uh, she's only really a character in the f the first season. Now, throughout the whole series, there are various characters that come and go. The head of the Bureau of Investigation that Bergerac works for in Jersey throughout most of the series is called Inspector Crozier, played by Sean Arnold. And uh, although by season nine, I think he's pretty much gone. I don't actually remember him being in any of those episodes. In the early episodes, there's a sort of sec office secretary, Charlotte, played by Annette Badland. And, and about halfway through the series, she's replaced by another character, a slightly older lady called Peggy, played by Nancy Mansfield. Yeah, there were various um, sort of sidekicks that Bergerac have throughout the series. Again, they change about halfway and a new set of uh, characters emerge. But uh, I don't want to get too confusing or go into too much detail because it's the stories that really matter. And uh, 
The only other characters I should mention are Diamante Lil, played by Mella White. She runs a pub in the early series, later on a nightclub. I don't recall it being mentioned what happened to her. I may be wrong. I've watched these episodes quite a few times, but I can't remember everything. But no, I don't think it's mentioned what happens to her. Now, I started to tell you about the main ladies in Bergerac's life. And as I say, in series one, it's Francine. In series two, there's a character called Marianne Bellshade. Now, she's played by Celia Imrie, who's best known for her work with Victoria Wood. It's quite a strange pairing those two have. I wouldn't say it's quite Steed and Emma Peel, because, well... (laughs) <laughs> Bergerac's certainly not as uh, uh, suave and sophisticated as John Steed, but there's definitely one episode where they share a bed. That's partly because they're pretending to be married as part of an investigation. Marianne isn't actually a detective, but uh, there's definitely something going on between them. But uh, yeah, she sort of vanishes after the second series. That makes it sound like a plot point, and it really isn't. She's gone by series three. And in series three, he doesn't really have a girlfriend. Those episodes do tend to focus more on the fact that his ex-wife Debbie and their daughter Kim they're they're definitely around more in series three but then slowly from series four onwards we see the introduction of Susan Young an estate agent played by Louise Jameson now Louise Jameson obviously is also known for playing Leela in Doctor Who now whilst Louise Jameson only played Leela for well two seasons, a season and a half. She is involved with Bergerac from early on in series four until she's written out at the start of season eight, which is the penultimate series. And uh, I can't say too much, but she does have quite a dramatic ending. A lot of the time that uh, Bergerac is with Susan, um, Susan and Bergerac are, well, they're on and off. They're very much an on and off couple, partly because of the job, you know, Jim's always running off to solve some crime or another and poor old Susan is left sitting in a restaurant um, looking forward to some some nice dinner with Jim only to find that Jim hasn't turned up or has turned up and then after five minutes has had to rush off again. But uh, anyway, so yes. So the last two seasons, well, during the um, penultimate season, he meets uh, Danielle, played by Therese Leotard. Danielle's father owns a vineyard and this sort of takes the series to France quite a great deal because by this point, well I think certainly by season 9, Bergerac's pretty much a private detective rather than working for the Jersey police. But uh, Although I've liked the show since the 80s and we used to watch it as a family and we also used to go to the Channel Islands uh, as a family for summer holidays. Occasionally when we were on holiday we'd spot them filming and uh, Bergerac drove a particularly notable car. It was uh, a Burgundy 1947 Triumph Roadster. Yes. Yeah, I don't know anything about cars, but this is what it says on Wikipedia. So, even though I've watched the series for years, and I own the series, um, only very recently did I actually watch the final episode, literally this year. The very final episode sort of moves the plot on even further, uh, by which point he's no longer even with Danielle, um, and he sort of hit the bottle again. And, uh, yeah, there are some sort of hints as to what might happen next. Well, of course, we all know that Jim Bergerac ended up on Midsummer Murders. Yes, uh, with a false name. And No, he didn't know. But, uh, anyway, that was John Nettle. Anyway, let me rattle through some of my favourite episodes. One thing that is notable about Bergerac is that there are certain episodes that have a sort of supernatural element. So, although it's... Uh, no, it's generally... It's a... Um, stories are sort of crime related there are one or two episodes particularly from the four series onwards that have sort of slightly well slightly sinister twists if you're interested in that episodes you might uh, be interested in seeing include what dreams may come uh, poison fires in the fall and uh, the dig which involves a viking curse and uh, warriors which is about a group who believe in the existence of atlantis but uh, so yes it's not always you know terribly dry and terribly serious in fact charlie hungerford is definitely sort of partly associated with comic relief in the series because some of the things that he does raise a smile there is one other character that i should mention and uh, she's played by lisa goddard she's known as the ice maiden um, her real name is philippa vale and she's a lady jewel thief i suppose and uh, she appears in sort of half a dozen episodes oh and the other thing before i go on 
is for fans of Doctor Who, there are lots of connections with Doctor Who. From the writers, Robert Holmes, Bob Baker, Dennis Spooner, even Brian Clemens, creator of The Avengers, writes an episode. Of course, uh, the show was created by Robert Banks Stewart, who uh, wrote Terror of the Zygons and Seeds of Doom. Of course, the show is littered with uh, famous faces. And uh, let me just pick through some of the seasons quickly. Um, So the first season has 10 episodes. And for instance, there are episodes about the arms trade. There's an episode about the suspicious death of a prominent local leader. There were stories involving drugs and uh, Russian defection and uh, in the first season we got cameos by Prunella Scales, Ian Hendry, Tino Evans, Patrick Moa, Kevin Stoney, Jeffrey Belden, Maureen O'Brien, Warren Clark, Greta Scacchi. So uh, the second season there's a story set in France. We've got Gareth Thomas, Anthony Valentine, Catherine Shell, Joanne Wally, Norman Wisdom, uh, Richard Griffiths, Jeff Raw. Nicholas Ball, Peter Craze, and uh, yeah, there were quite a range of different stories in the second season. Um, for instance, the episode with Nicholas Ball is called Miracle Every Week. It says in the synopsis, Jim must protect an Indian faith healer from con men out to exploit his abilities. Another episode, a perfect recapture. A wheel drop from a flying plane and a trail of Mark Franks leads Jim and a dogged mainland detective to a computer embezzler who stole two million pounds from the police ten years earlier. The following episode, The Moonlight Girls, Jim's investigation into the death of a young woman supposed to be working at a local stable reveals a profitable cool girl operation. So, uh, yeah, all sorts of different things. Um, in the third series, you have cameos from people like Michael Angelis, Richard Herndor, Dennis Lill, Tony Selby, and that's also the first season that Lisa Goddard appears in. Um, now, um, there are really good episodes in all three seasons. Where, where I think the series really gets strong is that middle period where Louise Jameson comes into it, and uh, that's from the fourth series, which is 1985. Cameos in the fourth series include Bernard Archer, Charles Gray, Beryl Reed. Um, Lisa Goddard returns in the episode Return of the Ice Maiden. One of my favourite episodes of that series is called Chrissy. Uh, Jim is under pressure to find a briefcase containing fashion designs and a baby who disappeared with her nurse. It's after the fourth series that we start having the Christmas special. Fires in the Fall with Amanda Redman. A spiritualist contacts the ghost of a dead arsonist responsible for the death of a young girl at the same time as a new series of fires breaks out resembling his earlier handiwork. Um, that, uh, that was written by Chris Boucher. Another Doctor Who connection. That was a really good one. The fifth series has cameos from Judy Cornwall, Michael Gambon, Lisa Goddard's back again. Um, Probably my favourite episode of that series is called Poison, and uh, Alfred Burke appears in that episode. And the plot of that one is Jim investigates when a mason drops dead in the middle of his initiation ceremony. Of course, Charlie Hungerford is uh, (laughs) involved. Now, um, the Christmas special on 87, that uh, was another of the Lisa Goddard episodes. Uh, The sixth series in 88, Lisa Goddard returns again. (laughs) It's not just Lisa Goddard, I promise you. Um, You know, in a series of, say, ten episodes, you uh, usually find in this period that, uh, yeah, the Ice Maiden will return at some point. But as you can see, in the later series, you're still getting good cameos, people like Kenneth Cope, Stephen McGann, David Troughton, Jeffrey Beavers, Tony Robinson. Uh, Tony Robinson appears in the second episode of the eighth series in 1990. That's the same series as the episode involving the archaeological dig. And the eighth series also has appearances by Julian Glover and Jeffrey Palmer. I used to think that the last two seasons of the show weren't, you know, they were definitely the show sort of perhaps showing signs of tiredness but actually watching it again more recently i do feel like it's actually trying to find a way of changing things and uh, i think even though uh, susan louise jameson's character wasn't always treated that well uh, she did have some really good stories where she was really in the forefront of events if there's an episode you want to watch with louise jameson in, i would highly recommend desirable little residence from 1987 which is part of the fifth season 
So, yeah, a bit of a mixture for her, but I don't think Danielle, the Danielle character, was as strong. But then they did try to change things by having her more associated with France. I definitely think it helps to freshen things up, having Bergerac dating somebody outside of Jersey, and also to the point where he's leaving the police force and trying to be a private detective. So uh, looking back, yeah, at the time maybe I didn't appreciate those changes, or I basically, uh, I was of the age where um, Louise Jameson being in the show was one of the main draws for me. So watching it now, yeah, I can see that they're trying to change things around. Yeah, mostly it, it was pretty successful. By the time of the eighth or ninth series, some of the, the writers that, that I mentioned earlier who are connected with Doctor Who had all pretty much moved on. And uh, yeah, there was definitely a change in the the writing team and uh, but overall it's definitely a series worth investing time in now i was in jersey myself just a few months ago i went to the local museum and they were doing an exhibition on uh, jersey in the 80s and uh, they had tied it in to episodes of bergerac so uh, they would pick say an episode of bergerac that perhaps was involved with pollution and then they'd kind of and then they kind of widen it out and so well you know in the 1980s pollution was this or here's an episode of Bergerac where people were worried about nuclear war and yes this is how it worked into real life uh, they, they didn't have a lot of photos or video footage from the show but they were definitely trying to uh, show how Bergerac was a show that tapped into the things that mattered to people in the 80s so I appreciated that they tried to tie it all in so ultimately I'd say give it a go there are a lot of interesting episodes in there they're all pretty different and uh, some shows can fit into a formula that gets very repetitive and I wouldn't say that's really the case with Bergerac they, they do try and um, make the stories as different as possible and uh, you know and you can't always take that for granted in a lot of shows particularly not shows that last as long as Bergerac lasted so you know it was a full 10 years so yeah I'd say go check it out because if you don't watch it you'll be Breaking the law. Oh, yeah. And thank you to Paul for that. Yes, thank you, Paul. Another interesting article. Yes, Paul has got some other things coming up in the future, we yes. hope. So. so stay tuned. More from him later. Mm. Um, but now, Warren, mad fool that he is, <laughs> um, wanted to interview us Did for he? some reason. Okay. I don't know that we've got anything particularly interesting to say, but mm. uh, yes, he wanted to ask us some questions. So let's see what he, he wanted to know. <laughs> and we'll be back later. Well, we'll be back now. But this is in the past. So, yeah. yes, you know. Back soon. That's it. Bye. Bye. Hello, and joining me on the rack today. <laughs> the rack? On the rack. <laughs> By the washing up rack. Absolutely. <laughs> That's going to be a bit crowded. <laughs> <laughs> Next to your crockery. Right. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourselves. Uh, I must be Andrew. Yes, you must. And I must be Lisa. Oh, and you've mm-hmm. both... Is yeah. that the first question? It is, yes. Okay. Well done. You okay. the, yeah, that's right. 100% so far. Points, and yeah. you got it in the right order as well. I knew that. <laughs> I can recognise me. Uh, you're both creators, producers, okay. contributors yes. to mm, a podcast known as Around the Archives. Which is... Yeah, well, oh, they should know that because they're listening to it. Yes. Absolutely. They yeah. should. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Oh, okay. Blimey. Yes. Uh, I'm going to um, throw them in randomly. Okay. I like random. Oh, we do like random. <laughs> okay, well, let's start with what's the most uh, the program with the most dire title sequence or theme tune you that you can think of that really makes you cringe? Oh, there's one that really grates on me, <laughs> <laughs> and I might even subject the listeners to it. Ooh. It's Barnaby the Bear. Oh no! Um, from the you got chocolate on your t-shirt. So you didn't need to point that out on audio. <laughs> It's right off a grandfather, grandpa's <laughs> I'm wearing a Grandpa Monster t-shirt with chocolate down it. Yes. Okay. What do I miss? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Hey, come on. Uh, Barnaby the Bear, as <laughs> sung by that well-known singer, Colin Jeevans. Oh. <laughs> He's neither cute or can sing. <laughs> so and I'm going to have to drop a bit in now mm. to listen to. So mm. here's Barnaby the Bear. 
If you want to sing this way, think of what you'd like to say. Add a tune and you will see just how easy it can be. Treacle pudding, fish and chips, fizzy drinks and licorice, flowers, rivers, sand and sea, snowflakes and the stars are free. La 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 So Barnaby the bear's my name Never call me Jack or James I will sing my way to fame Barnaby the bear's my name Sorry Sorry about that but you've had to listen to Barnaby the bear It's awful I've just <laughs> monitored your uh, listenership and it's dropped by 90%. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's one of those, it's just trying far too hard to be upbeat and cheerful and happy. Cute. And just all Failing it does is on all great. Because, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, yeah, oh no, 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 no. Well, Lisa, how would you go with that question? For me, it would be Dog Tanyon and the Masker Hounds. Oh, why is that? Because he's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say. Just listen to it. Okay. He's annoying. Oh, well, right. He's perky. And, and Oh, but we don't like perky. No. False perky. Yeah. We yeah. don't like false perky. Yes. Okay, here we go. So, uh, what program is, is almost but forgotten these days, but has a very special memory that you hold? Or something that might sit in the back of your subconscious. Yeah. Go for that one, Lisa. Oh, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, I might have to have a think about that. You, know, you know. well, um, it's it's weird. There's a number of things that I can remember. Um, but are you going to ask about early memories as well later or not? Um, you, you could bring early memories into this. I'm, I'm, I'm going yeah, to I'm gonna name a, I'm going to name a few shows. Mm. Um, and some of them I've sort of tried to find copies of over the years, and occasionally YouTube will 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 come up with with some long forgotten things. Um, I think people of my age probably remember words and pictures. Oh yeah, I like words and pictures. Yeah, but you remember? I remember wordy, wordy. which is like a sort of I don't know what he was. He was some sort of weird thing with typewriter keys. Oh, orange on him. blob, orange yeah. black blobby yeah. thing. Yeah, but. Previous to that, there was a sequence in it called Sam on Boff's Island, which is really one of my earliest TV memories. Um, and it was, I, I was so pleased to find a clip of it um, recently. It was presented by um, Tony Robinson, and the animation was done by Postgate and Fermin. When this winking light you see, say these words out loud to me. Words and pictures. I am a boff. I am a boff too. We live on On Boff's Island. Island. Boff? Yes, Boff? Where is the Sam? Ah. And of course, everybody remembers all their other work. Mm-hmm. But the moment you see it, you recognise it's by Postgate and Fairman. And what I remember, and this is going to be about 1972, 73, so I would have been about f- four, maybe. Um, it, was, it was all to do with words and the way words were made. And... They they had this weird machine um, that you could type the words into, and the thing that you typed into the machine would appear. So it was a bit like a sort of replicator on Star Trek: The Next Generation or something, or indeed a three D printer. But the the words were made up of the individual letters, and the letters were made from recording the sound of these birds, the say birds. So there was a bird that was would say the letter B. It would go B, 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 and you'd get all these little B's going on a little sort of um, sort of conveyor belt thing. And then you type the word bananas out of all the letters, and then you put the word bananas into the machine, and some bananas would appear. And it's only recently I found that that clip. But it seems to be utterly forgotten. There's Sam on Boff's Island. It's called. And yes, 
I'm thinking about it for me. I'm not sure it's forgotten, but one of my earliest things because I don't, I can't remember from when I was really young, but I do remember emu, 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 emu. <laughs> and the pink windmill, well, which also oh, has an irritating theme that's, thing. That's, that's on but TV, wasn't it? It is. Yeah, because yeah. I remember emu's broadcasting bags. company. I'm yeah, not old enough for that. But yeah. that's before. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this was uh, it was him, and he lived in a pink windmill, and there were kids, and there was a witch that got bags, and there's Croc oh, yeah. and a rubbish robot who I still can't remember what it's called. Like Croc bag. Croc bags is Carol Lee Scott. Yeah, yeah, that's it. yeah, yeah. And and somebody knock on the door, and I go, "There's somebody at yeah, the, the door." door. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, and that's it. That's yeah. just come flooding back yep. like a rash. So, <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Quick one in there. Yeah. Magpie, or Blue Peter. No thinking about it. Blue Peter. Blue Peter. Oh, why? I'm not old enough to remember Magpie. I'm afraid I wasn't another of these people that... Sta- if you turn the telly on, it would be on BBC One. Yeah. Yeah, that was what the button was always... It was partly that yeah. as well, yeah. The okay. button was always on BBC One. Yeah. yeah. Not right. always, but... Mm. Days before remote but, controls. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. Your most scary public information film that you saw during your childhood. So I don't really remember the public information films because they're seventies and I was born in seventy two. So by the time I was old enough to really sort of watch television, they probably weren't so many of those. But in hindsight, it'd probably be the fridge one. Oh, is that what's the fridge one? The fridge one, which is like people that like. Fridges that are going to be Killer fridges. thrown Killer away. Fridges. Killer fridges, yeah. Going to be thrown away, don't get in the fridge. Because once the door's shut, you can't breathe, basically. I think is, is I the thing that of one. the... That's, <laughs> isn't that why they had to change the title sequence to the Wombles? Oh, yeah, because of the yes, fridge. Yes, they're going through the fridge. Yeah. The opening yes. title sequence of early Wombles is a yes. fridge that the door falls open. Yeah. Yeah. And then later Wombles, it's a television set. Yes. Yeah. And I think there was a complaint that kids might play in fridges and yeah. get trapped in them. Now, this one for Andrew. I don't mm. know if you remember this. When we were at Cranwell Middle School, they played us some. Mm. They We had the, the film projector and they played us some public information films about playing on... Um, <coughs> <laughs> playing on farms and farmyards. Yeah. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember that, that yes. one. I've well, seen that re- more recently. Because I grew up on a farm, to me that was obvious. Yeah. That I, why would you need a film to tell you not to do that? Yeah. But don't drink yeah. rat poison so, so, and travel on the back of well, a Well, yeah, obviously yeah. you don't do that. So, <laughs> so those ones didn't really affect me because I think the one that um, sort of the one that sticks in my head though is the kid running along on the beach. With the broken bottle. Oh yeah, that's quite. And scary. he's about, oh, I and, don't the, and that, it no. freeze frames just as his foot's about to go on the jagged Ooh. glass. And I don't know quite whether they did let the kid just stand on it or something, <laughs> but, but that yeah, I mean, I remember you know things like Joe and Petunia and the sort of oh, yeah. swimming ones. And, but since I couldn't mm. swim, I wasn't going anywhere near the water anyway. <laughs> so. I always remember the Donald Pleasance being the, oh, the, the creepy of, mug. Oh, yes. right, the, right, the voice, the voice of, of death. death. <laughs> thank you to Warren for yes, interviewing thank us. Thank you, Warren. That yes. was an interesting day. <laughs> uh, part two of that interview should appear on the next episode which will be episode 14 oh my goodness me and now uh, we've got uh, another interview coming up with somebody that we've wanted to get on here for quite some time yes we finally managed to corner him we did a few days ago it was raining you couldn't run away and it was absolutely chucking down (laughs) in the middle of a food festival in poundbury yes so if there's Uh, noise that's why there is yes but uh yes it's it's Mr. John Chalice. Yes. So. TV's um, Boise. Yes, amongst mm. other things. But mm. uh, let's see what he's got to say. Yeah. See you soon. Bye. The Andy Williams show is at ten past seven. But now, part one of this week's Zed Car story, which is in black and white.
Hello, we find ourselves in the middle of Poundbury and we've stumbled across television's John Chalice. Hello, television's John Chalice. Say hello. Uh, hello. Uh, why are you stumbling? Had too much cider, I suppose, <laughs> I have you? I haven't been on the cider. Oh, you haven't. Oh. But, uh, it's about time you started. Well, I will do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just wanted to ask you about your memories of working on Z cars, believe it or not, because we've had a request. Z cars? Z cars. It's a hundred years ago, isn't I know. it? Um, yeah, so one of the first tellies I ever did, I was terribly excited to be asked to be in Z cars. Um, and I uh, played a character called Sergeant Culshaw, I believe it's called, and I became a sort of semi-regular on its station sergeant type. So I wasn't out of the cars in the action shots. I was, uh, I was back at the station and um, I was always answering the phone, I remember. I was picking up the phone saying things like, uh, Hello. Oh, hello, Mrs. Thompson. Yep. Yeah. Oh, the cat's got stuck up a tree again, is it? Right, we'll send someone round. St- stuff like that, and then cut. You know, it's all the action of the boys in the cars and so on. But um, Z Cars was groundbreaking, of course, at the time. It was the first of the sort of gritty uh, reality police series um, all those years ago. I mean, we're very big fans of it. and Yeah. We've seen some of the black and white stuff and we've seen some of the colour stuff, but unfortunately we've never actually seen one of yours yet. Have you not? Well, you, you missed out because those are the best episodes of the lot, of course, <laughs> the ones I was in. Now, I think, it was, I think it was black and white, all the ones I did. And, uh, can, can, you, can you remember who, was, um, who were the directors on some of those? Ooh, directors, <laughs> good heavens. Uh, wait a minute. Um, I think um, who's, one of them uh, finished up being my agent, didn't he? Um, was it Tim? Tim, who was it? My agent, Tim. Tim Coombe. Oh, Tim Coombe was a staff director at the time, I think. Uh, Barry, 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 somebody, Barry Davis. No, no, he was somebody. Come on. Um, anyway, it was it was usually BBC staff directors, wasn't it? I think at the time. But I was in and out of it really for two years, and uh, I'm very, very proud of it. Um, as I say, I didn't have a lot to do, but um, I just. Because it was such a groundbreaking series, I was very excited to be in it, I have to say. Uh, the first of a lot of police, I played a lot of policemen, uh, mainly because I was so tall and good looking. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I, I was right because I had a slightly laconic attitude, I suppose. And, uh, and um, yeah, I was tall, you know, and I looked like a policeman. So, uh, so it was the first of a, a lot of policemen I played. So. We're in Dorset today, and there's a load of noise on the PA system, so we apologise for that. Uh, but you've got two associations uh, with Dorset, uh, which are very dear to us, which are Seeds of Doom and Beaugest, oh, both working for Douglas Camfield. Now, our friend Michael Seeley's just done a book on Douglas, so uh-huh. I just wondered if you'd like to share your memories of working with Douglas on the, on this and the, and the Sweeney which we've just seen you in yes uh, well uh, Douglas was uh, just one of those directors uh, one of the only directors who ever employed me twice <laughs> <laughs> but three, he was he, three times at least yes oh yeah yeah. in fact wow. in fact, I think it was four so, eventually because I did a uh, I did a, a sort of thriller for him called Number on End um, when I played the South African Assassin which was uh, rather good fun uh, but he was a good friend uh, Douglas and uh and he, he was a great military expert and um, working with him on things like Beaugest when he never had the time to do it properly. It was sort of, OK, chaps, out of the trenches, over the top, and let's get this done, you know. That's how he directed and it. And it was great fun. And I was part of um, a little repertory company he had. A lot of people worked for him two or three times, you know. And luckily I was one of those. Um, but he was a dear man, and I actually lived next door to him, can you believe, for, uh, for a short period. And we played tennis together, and we threw frisbees, and we did all sorts of silly things together. And uh, when he passed away, you know, tragically, at the age of 50, I mean, it was a terrible, terrible shock. And, uh, and me and several other sort of actors who knew him... He just he, he just engendered this sort of loyalty about him. You, you'd follow him anywhere. You'd do anything for him, you know. And we carried his coffin into the church, and we were all just tears pouring down. It was awful. Couldn't stop crying, you know. And and it wasn't just because we thought our career was at an end, <laughs> which a lot of cynics would probably say. But it was, as I say, he was very unusual because he really cared about his people, and uh, and he gave people a chance, and. Um, I think he was a born-again Christian, 
you know, and uh, he never talked about that, but he, he really believed in that, giving people a chance and looking after people. And uh, a very rare, very rare man. And uh, he had this reputation of being able to do vast stories like Beaugest in a very short space of time and get it in under budget on time. And that's why uh, the BBC loved him, you know, particularly the BBC. Um, because he was a great organiser, a great list maker, and he really worked things out. And if uh, if you were lucky enough to be employed by him, you were part of the team, and you were part of that platoon, and you were going to get the job done, you know. And I miss him. I miss. I still miss him. And uh, in my autobiography, I've, uh, there's a picture of me and him together. And uh, every time I look at it, I think, God, I wish he was still around. I really do. Yeah. Well, I have to say that as a kid, the Seeds of Doom was one of the scariest things I'd ever seen. Um, but it's also, as an adult, it's one of the best Doctor Who stories I've ever seen. Um, so I'd like to thank people that have been involved in that story. You know, there's, there's a few people still around, Graham Harper, uh, Tom, of course. Yeah. Uh, sadly, we lost Liz Sladen a, oh, yeah. a few years ago now. But um, I think that's one, of the story, that's one of those stories that turned me into a fan. Yeah. And sort of, you know, put me on a career of being a fan. And ultimately, it's one of the reasons I ended up with my partner, Lisa. Oh, right. through, through Doctor Who fandom so I've got to thank people like you for having in, in, an influence on our lives ah. which is true well that's very nice uh, very nice of you to say so that was uh, Seeds of Dooms one of the happiest jobs I ever did um, again with uh, with Douglas and um, and Tom Baker who talk about larger than life you know and a lovely Liz Sladen and uh, again unbelievably no longer with us you just can't can't get your head around it you know Tony Beckley of course was in it and uh, it was the only time I worked with him and uh, and he was he was great fun to be it was just a great bunch of people and and uh, Douglas was really good at getting uh, the right people together you know um, I uh, yeah as I say it remains just such a happy memory for me and uh, and to see it back you know and you think god those are the good old days of, of Doctor <laughs> Who you know but it's great to hear you've uh, it meant so much to you, and uh, and you met the lovely Lisa as well. So I mean, how lucky is that? Brilliant. Okay, thank you, John. That's lovely of you. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thank you. And thank you very much to John for that. Yes, thank you, John. Lovely it's piece. Very kind of you. And thank you to his lovely wife, Carol, for letting us um, shelter shelter in there. Gazebo when it absolutely <laughs> fell down with rain. Yes, indeed. Warren uh, turned up and got to say hello briefly, which yes. was nice. Yeah. Um, just thought we ought to briefly um, go through John's Z Cars episodes. Okay. And normally none of which we think uh, have seen yeah, because so they. Didn't do those on the DVD. Yeah, the DVD and releases or either side of it. Are, are sort of exactly in the middle. Yes, um, it's most fir- annoying. So yeah, John's first one is "If I Can't Have Him" parts one and two from nineteen sixty-seven, which does exist. Right, and it's directed by Eric Hills. Mm-hmm. His next one's not till nineteen seventy-one though. It's part one of the Horse Dealer, okay. which is missing, and was directed by Christopher. Barry. Oh, which is so the Barry. He it was the Barry, of. yeah, so it wasn't Barry Letts at all. Oh, I didn't yeah. really think it was. I said it and then thought, oh no, it's yeah. probably not because he was a producer. But the Tim funny. Coombe one is Last Bus to Newtown mm. from 1972, which is also missing. Right. Um, we should say about Tim Coombe that oh. um, the name Tim Coombe was used by John Pertwee as a, as a voice exercise, oh, yes. wasn't yes, it? Yes, because he used to do a group Yeah, because they, they used in to the morning, clear their they? sort of throats yes. um, by going, Tim Coom, yeah, which replaced what they used to say. Yeah, previously mm-hmm. it was Harry Roy, so yes. so it was Harry Roy. Yes, and Harry Roy was a sort of band leader. Yes, from the nineteen thirties, mm-hmm. who uh, uh, did some interesting songs. Yes, because we've recently um, looked him up. Yes, and we found a song from nineteen thirty one, "My Girl's Pussy." Mm-hmm which um, does sort of link into what we're going to do next. Yes. So here's a little short bit of My Girl's Pussy from Harry Roy. There's one pet I like to pet And every evening we get set I stroke it every chance I get It's My Girl's Pussy Seldom plays 
and never purrs. And I love the thought it stirs, but I don't mind because it hurts. My girl pussy, often it goes out at night, returns at break of dawn. No matter what the weather's like, it's always nice and warm. It's never dirty, always clean, in giving thrills, never mean. But it's the best I've ever seen, is my girl pussy. Well, I can't see any double meaning there, can you? No, not at all, no. no. <laughs> but yeah, real shades of Mrs. Slocum's pussy from yes. Are You Being Served. And of course, John played Captain Peacock in the recent remake, or he the did. recent new episode. Pilot. Pilot, Pilot whatever. Yes. Um, yes, so where were we? Uh, 1972 sees John in the episode Lynch, directed mm. by Gerald Blake, which is also missing. Mm-hmm. 1973, mm-hmm. Inspector Lynch, mm-hmm. uh, directed by Ron Craddock. Oh, the shapely... Shapely, honey blonde Ron Craddock. Head-turning Ron Craddock. We'll explain that one next time, hopefully. Uh, 1973, Pieces. Um, everything exists from this point on, by the way. Pieces, 1973, Eric Davidson, The Cinder Path, uh, Joan Craft, also 1973. Allegiance, 1974, Eric Hills. Um, Intruder, 1974, Mary Ridge. Mm -hmm. I just need to turn my notes over. Bits and Bats, 1974, Michael Bryant. Quiet as the Grave, 1974, Derek Martinez, or Martinus. I never know how to pronounce that. No, I would have said Martinez. All right, and Bit of Business, 1975, Oliver Horsebruff. Or however you say that name. I always said Horsburg. Horsburg. No, no, it's B-R-U-G-H. Bruff. I don't know. John would know to say that. But yes. <laughs> Maybe. But yeah, we are going to be seeing John again fairly soon. Because um, mm. we won't be forgiven if we don't plug no. uh, his upcoming We've events. Asked multiple times to plug his yes. multiple events. Uh, his multiple events. Because he does a um, evening a one, sort of a, a, a re- one-man show. A, one wo- a one-woman a one show. Woman show. <laughs> That's what we used to say about yes. Pertwee. Yeah. Um, yes, John's one-man show about his sort of career, mm-hmm. which is highly recommended. Yes. Um, we're going to be seeing him at the Little Theatre in Bournemouth on mm-hmm. the 10th of November. Yeah. Um, he's also appearing, uh, well, if you go to his website, which is www.wigmorebooks.com, there's a tab, mm-hmm. um, events, which is well worth a look. Uh, it doesn't list the Weymouth appearance. The Weymouth appearance um, is the day after, on the 11th, mm-hmm. and that's at the Riviera Hotel in Weymouth. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he's also then he's appearing at, in Bath on the 12th. Um, but yeah, there's lo- there's loads of upcoming appearances listed. Also, um, his books as well. His new book, Wigmore a- Abbey, which we've just uh, mm-hmm. got about his uh, lovely house. Then. Two autobiographies, uh, being Boise, Boise and Beyond. Um, and, and two novels. And two novels as well. Um, Reg- Reggie, A Stag at Bay and Reggie in the Frame. And the, what was the other the other new book? Um, that was, book that was the David Hemmings one. David that Hemmings. You, you, you've just got that, haven't you? Yes. So, yeah. yes, all in all, yes, David Hemmings blow up and other exaggerations. Yeah. Um, but yes, all, all well worth a look yes, at, at yes. Jo- on all John, on his website all on his website and he will sign them for you yes and I don't know if he's still got his bicycle I don't but, know so. but yes um, and now we'll zoom on to the final big article mm-hmm. which is are you being served yes ok here mm-hmm. we go ok see you soon there's a new look to Monday evening entertainment on BBC One at 7 o'clock, Terry Wogan begins the first of his thrice-weekly Wogan shows, early evening entertainment with a touch of topicality. At 8.30, are you being served in a perennial problem for Mrs Slocum? When they rang from the hospital to say they had a bed, I thought, I'm not parting with it. <laughs> what, whatever happens? 20 minutes later, my pussy was in a basket on its way to Scotland. <laughs> This is the new look to Monday evening on BBC One. Ground for perfumery, stationery and leather goods, wigs and haberdashery, kitchenware and food. Uh-huh. 
So, Lisa, are you being served? Yes. <laughs> are you being ser- not? Are, no, are you being served? Is that, is that, served? that the answer <laughs> to, to the question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are you being served? I love Are You Being Served. And we've, it's, in it's, preparation for this article, we've watched ev- episodes from every season. Every season. Uh, series. Season, series, series for, yeah, whichever. Whatever, yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. we've really enjoyed we have. doing we have. it. We started out thinking we won't pick our favourites because we always watch the same ones and we got towards the end and we went, oh, well, let's just watch the ones we really, really like watching. So we've just, about ten minutes ago, finished watching The Hold Up. Which is from series ten, yes. and we yeah we'll talk about the yeah. hold up in a bit more detail in a minute in yeah. a minute because it is one of your favourite episodes. It is one of my favourite episodes because it's just so ridiculous. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's, it's are you being served? It's probably one of the more famous series that we've covered. Yes, um, yeah. certainly probably more one of the well known series. Yes, I mean it's, it's well known in the in UK other countries as well. and indeed in the US because yes. it, it it sort of featured quite yeah. strongly on PBS. Yes. Stations. It's also really odd. Yeah. Send us your money, we'll show programmes. Yeah, because we found some P- uh, some PBS pledge footage of Molly Sugden yes. sort of promoting yeah. the series. But inevitably, people won't know what the series no. is. So yeah. just a quick run, th- r- run through of the setup. It's set in um, it. Grace Brothers Department Store. Mm-hmm. And you don't get department stores like this anymore because um, department stores now, places like... Um, Debenhams. Other mm-hmm. stores are available, <laughs> and in in John he, Lewis, John Lewis yeah. here in Paul, we, we have got a sofa from John Lewis. We did, yes, two sofas from John yeah. Lewis. Uh, here in Paul, we have Beals, yeah. which is a local Beals of Bournemouth department store, which is probably more along the lines of Grace Brothers, apart from the fact that it now has concessions in it, where Grace Brothers doesn't really have concessions. Mm. Each floor is is a different department, so you have. Um, you have a hardware department and a sporting department and a pets department and a beauty department and you have the gentlemen's department yes. and in the pilot episode they are joined by the ladies and they're going to share their floor with the ladies which is a thing unheard of <laughs> and mr granger is very upset about it mr granger mr is... granger is the senior salesperson yes and he doesn't like this and he doesn't like this he doesn't like a lot of things but the series starts in 1970 yeah it starts as a as a two comedy playhouse and it's created by jeremy lloyd and david croft and david croft so um, and didn't jeremy lloyd have some experience yeah jeremy lloyd had worked in simpsons i believe it was yeah when he was out of work because he'd been an actor he was out of work so he worked in simpsons for a bit and he'd got all this material um this is back in the days when sort of as i say department stores were very different to the way they are now i mean you work in retail i do yes um and where you work isn't quite quite the same no but you no. do get your you do share get, of yeah. of customers yeah. coming through the door don't yes. you who are can be uh, a slightly awkward hello oh, rose. rose is just jumping up that's what the scratching noise was hello Can rose sit down? yeah well most appropriate that our pussies come to visit isn't it um because we have to talk about mrs slocum's pussy yes mrs slocum is head of of the ladies, ladies wear and, she, and, Miss Brahms. and she's got an infamous cat a, a cat her pussy yes who she always you, refers it to you keep getting jokes about yeah. that yeah but let's just run through who the who the main cast yeah. so are. you have on the men's well first of all you have captain peacock mm-hmm. and he's the floor walker yes no now one. i don't think that job has existed for about 40 years but but the set is um yeah. there's two lifts aren't two there? Lifts, and when so the customers come, come out, out of the this lift, and down the stairs he will meet them up at the bottom of the stairs and, and say... And direct them to, oh, where you're being they, served, sir? to where they want to go. Oh, madam. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, um, played by Frank uh, Thornton. Frank Thornton. Uh, later played by John Chalice yes, in, the, in, in, in the recent in the, episode. In the more recent episode, yeah. Okay. Oh, careful, but you've got the menswear and the ladies, yeah. ladies department. And in now. the menswear department, I suppose we have the aforementioned Mr Granger. Played by... Paid by um oh I've forgotten his name. What's his name? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, gone blank. Mr. Granger. Yeah. Oh, I better look now. I shall have yeah. a look. Main characters. Mr. Granger Arthur is Bruff. Arthur Bruff. Yes. yes. Here we go. Yeah. And I think this was one of the bigger breaks for him, really, because he's not in many other things. He's in, he's in an episode of um Upstairs Downstairs, mm-hmm. and that's all. That's the only other thing I've ever seen him in. All right. So I've never seen him in anything. I shall, I shall just see if I can find um, anything else. 
And then his next, the next in line from him is. Oh, he's, he's in Z. He's in Z cars. Oh, and he, okay. He's in Dad's Dad's army as well because okay. he's the um, in a Wilson manager. He's at right. the bank that, oh, right, that, okay. that Wilson takes over. Uh, yes. Okay. He's also in Randall and Hopkirk to see Stand a Man Out Lives and Jason King. All right. Well, Jason I've, King. I've obviously Jason never King. seen any of those episodes. Okay. All so. right. But yes, I don't know okay. quite what Z cars he's in, but there okay. you go. So. Um, There's a bit of a Zed Cars theme here. But he, the series itself lasts for 10 series, doesn't it? it? Yes, 10 series over 11 years. So Arthur Breath lasts for the first, um, is from series one to, to series five, five. And then you keep getting replacements you for do. him, don't you? You do. Yeah, so you so get Mr. Tebbs. Yes. James Hayter. Yes. Mr. Goldberg. Yep. Alfie Bass. Mm-hmm. Mr. Grossman, Milo yeah. Sperber. And Mr. Klein. Benny Lee. Yeah, and they're both in the same Mr. series. Mr. Grossman and Mr. Klein both occur in season eight. Yes. And then after season eight... They, they sort of they sort just of give have, Mr. Have Humphreys... Have it with Mr. Humphreys and his assistant. Yes. Yes. And Mr. Humphreys is the next in line. Yes. And Mr. Humphreys is played by John Inman. Mm-hmm. Quite memorably. Yes. I mean, mm-hmm. John Inman, we've we've not just been watching Are You Being Served, we've no. been watching some John no, other John Inman bits and other pieces. Other John Inman episodes of series. things. Series, which yes. are Odd Man Out, yes, where he inherits the rock factory, a half of a rock factory, yeah, yep. and he got Peter Battleworth working there. And take a letter, Mr. Jones, and take a letter, Mr. Jones, which was filmed partly in Paul, yes, um, if pretending look, to be London, yes, yes. Yeah, that's Ruler Lenska is his yes. boss, in is this. his boss, yeah. And out of those two series, yes, which did you like the best? I liked Odd Man Out more, why? Because it wasn't um, as sexist, because it wasn't as, the sexist other one. as the other one, um, it was just a general better. Generally better set up, mm-hmm. I think. Now, so, now Mr. Humphreys, um, yeah. we sort of asked around, how would you describe Mr. Humphreys? How would I describe Mr. Humphreys? Mr. Humphreys is a little bit camp. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's he's possibly the nicest person there. Yeah. In the fact he never really seems to argue with anybody else. I mean, we asked on... Twitter and Facebook. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the implication is that Mr. Humphreys is gay, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Although sometimes the writers used to deny that. Yeah. I don't and, quite know And John Inman used to deny yeah. that. Mm, um, some, yeah, and we, th- we thought it it's not a series that gets repeated. No. Is it? Not. It did actually did. It, it, the, the BBC showed it on BBC Two in the afternoons for a bit. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So, right, right. not oh, a yeah. prime time repeat. Yeah. But yeah. It has been repeated. But not not in the way that Dad's Army is repeated, no, is it? No, no. Dad's, well, Dad, Dad's, Dad's Army, Army is, is a, repeated on a loop, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's a cl- crowd please at Dad's yeah. Army. There's nothing offensive in it. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yes, I'd forgotten about those yeah. repeats, actually. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes I have. But we, we thought it worth asking the question about mm-hmm. what did our sort of gay friends on Twitter yeah. think? Especially as we were, we, com- we were commemorating the 50th anniversary of the partial legalisation of homosexuality. Yes. So it's all tied in with that as well. Yes. Um, but I genuinely didn't know what the response was going to be. Because no. sometimes Are You Being Served is the sort of show that sort of flagged up a, as being very typically 70s, yes. isn't it, in terms of It is, yeah. Att- you've, got, you've got dolly birds and mm. things. But some... Re- I mean, we asked the question about Mr. Humphreys at half yeah. past three yeah. last... Was it last Sunday? No, Sunday before. Sunday before. Yeah. And we were still getting replies at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, and still getting day, day, a couple of days and, after and some, as well. And some, some days after. Yeah. And it was overwhelmingly in favour of Mr. Humphreys. Yeah, he's, he's a very popular character. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I can't thank you to everybody that yes, replied. Thank you so much. Um, just, and we, we can't crazy. read them all out because no. we'd be here for another half an hour just reading yes. out the replies. Yeah. But a few very quick ones. Um, Davy McGee, um, he was obviously having more sex than the straight men in the store and more fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, David Absalom, he's funny. There's clearly no malice in the jokes. The objection is that there were few other gay portrayals at the time. Uh, Michael Dennis, very much the Russell T Davies line. See last night's Queer as Art on BBC Two. When a brittle teenager, he was everything I resented, but now he's wonderful. Yeah, and Russell T Davies says much the says same. Says much the same, yeah. yeah. Uh, Michael Dennis, we should point out, wrote yeah. um, an episode of Queers that, he was, did. that was shown. A lovely episode of Queers. And, and you've yes. just got his I've, script book, I've got haven't you? Book, and he was yes. excited. He was very excited. Yeah. Ivan Kirby, I wasn't around at the time, but was very sniffy about him when I wrote about Are You Being Served as a Student in the Noughties. Now I realise he's just sheer fun. 
<laughs> but yeah, these. Oh, careful, Rose! Don't put put your feet on the. <laughs> Rose is loving me. But, uh, <laughs> um, yes. Where's the next? Where's the next? What, one of the um, other replies. Where are we? It was from Clayton Hickman. My opinion's always been the same. He's the nicest, kindest, least selfish person at Grace Brothers, and always gets the best laughs. Um, everybody at Grace Brothers um, really likes Mr. Humphreys. They all squabble with each other, but but rarely him. Mm. So, I think, yeah, it yeah. just just proves how popular Mr. Humphreys is. Was. And he always gets. I mean, not at the start so much, but as you you can tell as the series goes on that Mr. Humphreys and John Inman are becoming more popular. Because it was originally more of a vehicle for Trevor, Trevor Bannister, Bannister, wasn't yeah. it? But as the series goes on, Mr. Humphreys comes to the fore more. And even when he just comes in the room, into the department, yeah. usually dressed in some sort of outrageous um, outfit, um, he gets a huge round of applause. Yeah. You know, so... Oh, it's that American series yes, thing of, of if he's the star, he's the star comes yeah. in and, and the audience claps just when he walks through a door, basically. But usually with Mr Humphreys, it's because he's dressed in some ridiculous manner. Yeah. And we should point out his full name, which is Wilberforce Claiborne Humphreys, yes. which is brilliant. Yes. He also gets to play his own mother, doesn't he? Does, he does, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's in a couple of episodes. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. You've got Mr Lucas, Trevor mm -hmm. Bannister... Later replaced by Mr. Spooner, yeah. Mike Berry Mike from Wurzel Gummidge. Yeah. 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 So Captain Peacock is Frank Thornton, as we said. Uh, Mr. Um, Rumbold. Mr. Rumbold. Nicholas Smith. By the wonderful Nicholas Smith. Yeah, Mr. Rumbold is, is, is sometimes a bit overlooked, he isn't is. he? He is, and he's an unsung hero because he has to do... He's got quite a hard part Yeah, he does all the straight stuff. He mm. very rarely gets... He does sometimes in later episodes get... He's the brunt of a joke. Mm. But mostly he's just there to be the straight man and to get... Because normally what happens is if there's a dispute, they go in to see Mr. Rumbold and then he gets it all confused and it ends up worse than it was when they started. Because, yeah. you know, he gets it all wrong. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you know, applause to, to Nicholas Smith, yes. who, who is just wonderful, I he think, is. in everything he's in. He is, because he's, he's, in, um, he's in Zedcast as well. And if yes. you've not seen these Zedcast episodes, they're we, out we, on DVD, yeah. buy them. Yeah. They're brilliant. He, but the store itself is owned by Mr. Grace. Yes. Or young Mr. Young Grace, Mr. Grace, as they say, who's Harold Bennett. Yeah. Oh, we should also mention Miss Brahms as well. Oh, have we not done Miss Brahms? Not done Miss Brahms. Oh, okay. Played by um, Wendy Richard. Yes. Who obviously went she, later she, on to be in EastEnders. I mean, she lasts the full ten series. She does. She does. I mean, not everybody does, but you, no. you've got um, Mrs. Slocum and Miss Brahms, mm. uh, Captain Peacock, yeah. and uh, Mr. Humphreys. Is that it? That's and, and Mr. Rumbold. And Mr. Rumbold, yeah, yeah, and they're the only ones the that only last ones. the whole. Yeah, because you got you start off with Mr. Mash as well. Mr. Mash is the um, he's like the maintenance man, yeah. the caretaker kind of thing. Later replaced, he works in the packing department. Yeah, and he's later replaced by Mr. Harmon. Yeah, who works a lot better, I think. You, you think Mr. Harmon gets more to do? He gets more he? to do. He gets more involved in the schemes, whereas Mr. Mash, to a certain extent, is to the side making remarks so yeah, it, Mr Harmon gets the set like the certain episodes like the takeover where he he gets involved in it because they need somebody with these kind of accent in the hold up he gets involved um you know he gets involved in a lot oh when they do their sort of show things he's usually there in some sort of capacity because there's one where they do a radio show and he's doing the sound effects oh yes yeah, yeah. and everything because he also so. also sort of the maintenance people get to demonstrate these wonderfully ridiculous yes, visual, effects, visual effects don't they yeah, but you know um, it's things that light up or rotate, yep. or but they always go wrong. Yeah, there's there's, yeah. there's the infamous um, Father Christmas <laughs> oh, yeah, one, isn't the Father it? Christmas ho affair. ho ho, little boy, have I got a surprise for you? Yeah, and then he opens his coat, doesn't yes. he? Yeah, <laughs> and Mr. Humphreys faints. He does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, there's there's uh, we should say there's the two Mr. Graces. There's yes. young Mr. Grace, mm -hmm. Harold Bennett, and mm -hmm. old Mr. Grace. Played by Kenneth Waller. Who Ironically, was he was actually younger, younger than, than old, a young than, Mr. Grace. Than young Mr. Grace. Yeah. Um, but then you've also got the various sort of secretaries and assistants to mm -hmm. Mr. Grace and Mr. Rumbold as well. Yeah. Should mention as well the canteen manageress who they come into con conflict oh, with Dor on Dor Dor Vernon as numerous um, occasions. As apparently Diana Yardwick, apparently. Yeah. It is Mrs. Yardwick, yeah, because yeah, they... it was in the. Oh, they do say yeah. the other night where we because if you'd asked me a name, I wouldn't, wouldn't have known. Yeah, but they because there's one episode where they take over the canteen, 
Um, and it's 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 predictably silly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you do start to get sort of song and dance routines you do. a bit, don't yeah, you? Yeah, it comes a bit more variety in certain episodes, but it's... Especially in the Christmas yes, episodes. Yes, more in the Christmas well. episodes. Yeah. I mean, some of the Christmas episodes you definitely couldn't show again today <laughs> because but, of some of the things that happen, but it is the 70s. But so. the, the series, you know, is, is a success because not only does it get a spin off film, yeah. which isn't bad, it has no. to be said, the film's not mm. bad. Um, which is and, based on a stage play. Yes, yes, that's true. Mm. But yes, there are indeed stage plays during yeah. the rounds at the moment. Yes. yes. Yeah. But you also get um, an Australian version of yeah, it that's not great which is not great and um an american version mm-hmm. beans, of boston, beans of boston which is even worse yes <laughs> it has to be it has to be said yeah the australian version actually lasts for two series the Aus- well the australian version takes the uk scripts and pretty mm. much transplants apart them. from one mm. there is an original there is one, one yeah. original episode but yeah. i don't quite understand how that works because mr humphreys moves to australia yeah still played by john Earman. yeah goes to a store Mm -hmm. where everybody's got the same character name Mm -hmm. as all the people he's left behind. No, they're not all the same character name. Well, there's, there's no, he's got Captain Smoking. Wagstaff. Oh, 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 the different ones. Yes. But they have the same adventures. They have the same though, adventures and the same mannerisms. And they say the same lines, yes. pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so does, you, you'd have thought Mr. Humphreys would have cottoned on at some no, point, like he's in some sort of time loop. Yeah. Well, it's, it's I mean, it's a bit like Pertwee and Colin Baker in The Ultimate Adventure. You'd have thought <laughs> Colin Baker would have said, hang on, I've had this adventure before. Yeah. But, yeah, the... Uh, but, yeah, and Beans of Boston just seems to be a pilot episode, doesn't it? Yeah, it, dreadful didn't, it, copy didn't, it that didn't exists. make it any further than Because that, that's partially a rewrite of um, the German... German Week. German Week yeah. episode, isn't it? Yeah. But I think that's... Sh- it's something we've never really talked about when it comes mm-hmm. to comedy, though especially sort of multi-camera studio stuff is the if you watch the um british episode german week and then you mm-hmm. watch beans of boston yeah you can see just how precise the camera work is yeah it's very tight um because the there's some complex sort of dance routines mm. and the and the cameraman have got some very tight shots yeah. to line up and they're hitting the mark every every mm-hmm. time yes uh the american version just seems to be done more in wide shot isn't it because yes. uh, on the hopes that you could capture mm. most of the action yeah literally so it does, it's like put the camera and shoot it, it does sort of indicate i think the more rehearsal time you probably mm-hmm. had for the for the uk version i mean yeah. i don't know what the american or australian turnarounds were but i get the feeling they were done quicker and cheaper mm-hmm. um the the australian one you said is just full of adverts at the end it for, is um, for various people for all the furniture have, yeah loaned <laughs> things yes yeah. but yeah i, I mean let, let's quickly zoom on to the episode that you wanted to talk about which yeah. is the hold up yes now explain the plot of the hold up right. please so this is series, this is series 10. 10 so it's the last series which isn't always as well regarded as some of the earlier ones. I mean, series, but it's it's got some good ones in 10 it. Is directed by Martin Shardlow. Yeah, and again, maybe not the most familiar name, but somebody no. who's got he's done a lot of stuff, a lot of comedy. Yeah, and yeah. he directed um, the Black Adder yeah. series one mm-hmm. of Black Adder, mm-hmm. and I think the Black Adder is really well directed. Yes, it's, it's one of the There's best ones. There's a lot of yeah. good film work, and, and mm. even the studio stuff. The cameras zooming all over the place he doesn't yeah. get the chance to do that so much with are you being no, served it's a different kind of thing um yeah. but you know he, he he's i mean he's worked on a load of other things churchill said to me mm-hmm. which is the um frankie howard thing isn't it yes with uh nick nick is that the one that nick courtney's in yes yeah um mm. yeah little and large show mm-hmm. okay fair enough um he did direct some only fools and horses in 1980. Mm-hmm. 81, No Place Like Home, Terry in June. Mm. Lots of comedies, really. So, you know, a, a, a good track record, I think. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, quick, let's let's go back to the So, to yeah, the, the, the hold-up. They're stock-taking mm-hmm. or taking inventory. Yes. Do you have to do that? No. Okay. Oh, they do, actually. Yeah, they do They, they do a, what they call a count. Oh, right. Where okay. they count the stock. Okay. Um, so, yes, they do do that. I, I've never had to do it. They have special people. <laughs> don't come in and do that. Don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and um, so they're all staying late, beh- late in the store, and Mister Rumbold leaves with his secretary mm-hmm. to take his secretary home, mm-hmm. and then Mister Harmon 
um, comes up in the lift and says he's seen some burglars in the accounts department. So they try and work out what to do and they decide they're going to call the police and then the burglars come up in the lift. Now, Mrs Slocum has had to visit the ladies because the news that there are burglars in the store has made her very nervous and she needed to spend a penny. Now, one of the burglars is played by Michael Atwell. Michael Atwell, yeah. Yes. Um, possibly best known from Attack of the Cybermen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think he's probably better known or, for other stuff. Oh, I was going to say Bill Sykes. Oh, Bill Sykes in, in um, Oliver Twist. Oliver Twist, the Ten but Sticks the, production. There is other things he's been in. Yeah. He's usually he's oh, he usually was plays. Nice as well, he was he? nice warrior, yeah. yeah. But he usually plays the hard man. Yeah. In, or played the hard man. He was also stuff. a political cartoonist, yeah, I which didn't I didn't that. know. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, quite a skilled skilled yes. artist as well. Yeah. But it's good. <laughs> Um, you've, you've got the encounter between him and Mr. Humphrey. Yes, because basically so what happens how does is... That, how does that well, happen? Um, Mrs. Slocum comes back from the ladies and all the rest of the department are hiding behind the ladies' counter. And she leaves a handbag on the men's counter and they call her over and she hides. But then they realise if the burglars come back and see her handbag, they will realise that somebody's been around. Mm-hmm. So Mrs. M- Mrs. Miss Brahms goes to get it and... They come back and she poses as a mannequin and then they catch her. So they work out a way of trying to, to free Miss Brahms, which yeah. is basically, first of all, to send Captain Peacock and Mr Spooner in as policemen. Oh, yes. Which goes wrong. <laughs> so at that Isn't, point... Uh, Captain Peacock's armed with an ID card. An ID... A, a, a union pa- card. Which is Mr Harmon's... Yes. Um, union packing card. Packing union card. Yes. <laughs> And that's not going to convince anyone. No. He needs psychic paper at this yeah, point, doesn't he? He does. <laughs> but yeah, so you get, they, they catch Captain Peacock and Mr. Spooner, but the others are hiding outside the door and hear them talk about the Gumby Gang, mm-hmm. who are this, this gang that nobody's really ever seen. I love the name, the Gumby Gang, because yeah. that just conjures up um, yeah, Monty, Monty Python. Python. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically, once they've caught Captain Peacock and Mr. Spooner, the rest of them, which is Mr. Harmer, Mrs. Slocum, and Mr. Humphreys, dress up as the Gumby gang <laughs> so you get um, Mr Harmon with a sort of suit and hat on and a little pencil moustache yeah it's pa Gumby uh, pa Gumby Mrs Slocum basically dressed up like a sort of older version of Mae West yeah. <laughs> as Ma Gumby in a le- leather skirt that she can barely move in and Mr Humphreys is Mad Tony their son Italian Tony Italian no yeah is it Mad Italian? Tony alright yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, as he described it as like an ice cream salesman. Yes. They look sort of like, but yeah, so they try and... this sort of white suit, isn't white it, with suit a hat? with a hat with a curly black wig. Yeah. Which is stitched into the hat. Yeah. Um, but he has to sort of get hold of Michael Atwell at, at one, one point. point by yeah. the sort of, and he's got Michael this, Atwell's about a foot taller than is, John Inman, isn't he? And he's he? got a, this sort of fan and he flips the fan out. And as he sort of flips the fan out... It sort of hits Michael Atwell. It sort of hits Michael Atwell. And Michael Atwell starts, you see him start to laugh. Yeah, but he just manages to hold it in. He manages to sort of hold it in, yeah. But yeah, it's a wonderfully silly scene, like Miss John Inman threatening Michael Atwell, which you just didn't think would work. But But he does. But they're both acting it really well. They are acting it really well, yeah. 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 But it's, it was a really silly episode. It, it is, and it's just one of those one of those things. That if you've had a bad day, you can come yeah. home and you can watch. But you say I've been, been served is very much a, yeah. a comfort yes. thing, isn't it? But it it yeah. does stand rewatching, not rewatching because yeah. yeah. um, we know, do tend to watch the same episodes over and over again. We probably should spread them out yeah. a bit more because there doing, are certain episodes we really doing like. this rewatch. I think um, just zooming through, we didn't mm. watch everything, but we mm. watched some. I think the quality, people sort of say that the quality tails off. but yeah. I don't think it does. No. You know, there are still good episodes yeah. all the way through, yeah. I think. Because yeah. um, another favourite is, um, there's the episode from Series 8, uh, Is It Catching? Oh, yes. Where Mr Humphreys gets a tropical disease. He yeah. gets this disease called Marine's disease, which yeah. you catch from, catch from shellfish. Not sailors. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> which is the implication before. And they they have to be quarantined. Yeah. So they get quarantined in um sort of in the basement. In the basement. On a waterbed. On a waterbed. And there's this just this really silly scene and I know Jenny likes this, Jenny Shirt. Yeah. Um where they all have to try and lay still mm. so the waterbed won't move. Oh, bobble up and down. But, yeah. And then Mr. Humphreys gets to the next stage of the disease, which is sneezing, yeah. It all just goes crazy. Yeah. And it is silly because it's just the way they all bobble up and down. It's, you know, it's a cumulative <laughs> effect. 
But, you know, and this the episode, um, we also watched The Junior, which has got Mr... Which is Mr... Goldberg's introduction. Oh, yeah. And there's a great bit in that where there's this little old man who's played oh, Tony, by Tony Simpson, si- Tony Simpson, who's been in yeah. it before. Yeah. But you tend to use the same actors they go over and over again. And he comes in for the job and he's, he says, oh, I, where will we find you? I live in a packing case in Covent Garden. It's got bananas written mm-hmm. on the side and it's the only one with a chimney. Yeah. <laughs> it's really yeah. stupid. Isn't it? And then he goes off and they're like, oh, can't you give him a cup of tea? And Mr. Harmer says he's been here since three. He's yeah. had Four shepherd's pies and no, three shepherd's pies and four cups of tea. Whoops, that was <laughs> Rose. Right, Rose has just fallen off. <laughs> and he's, he's done a song and dance with spoons and got six quid. <laughs> so it's just it's, it's utterly ridiculous. But yes, I mean, but the, I think the best episodes of Are You Being Served are the ones where they dress up for some reason or other. Yeah. So you've got by appointment where they're expecting a visit by the Queen so they rehearse it with Mrs Slocum and Captain Peacock or Queen and Prince Philip (laughs) and it goes wrong as it always does yeah but yeah I mean yeah we were again we're sorry we're running out of time this is ridiculous Mm. but um it's 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 just fun isn't it I think I think I think you know and don't Mm. knock fun because because sometimes you need fun yeah it's it's Mm. it's just very watchable yeah you get some good guest stars yeah. coming in because yeah. I mean it, it's the thing that I, I said I said this when we were talking to John Chalice that the thing about are you being served is that the lift doors will open yeah. and a new customer will come yeah. in and every customer goes and then a the episode yeah. yes could you just be mm. revolve about what that new customer's story is but it very so, rarely revolves around the customer no it it's doesn't really it's about the staff no because no. so, it's about the characters. You know. You've got very strong characters yeah. that are very well balanced, yes. I think, and yeah. interact with each other very yeah. well. And we should just say our favourite character is Mr. Granger. Yes. Because he's wonderfully grumpy. He's so unsuitable, he's, isn't he? Yeah, he really shouldn't be as, working with the public. In a customer facing role. Because yeah. <laughs> what's that line he says about children? I dislike children intensely. In my opinion, children should be seen and not heard, or preferably not seen at all. And the thing about because when oh, they me, think me, they're gonna have to leave, the, Mrs. Gone. Granger doesn't like me going in the kitchen. She says I turned the milk sour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Mm. Oh, Rose is crushing in. But I'm afraid we're gonna have to wind this up because yeah. we're we're already overrunning on this article. But yeah. there we go. Are yes, you being but, served? Yeah. If you've never seen it, do yourself a favour and watch an episode. Yes, yeah, all available on DVD yes. and and well worth it. And I it's, think. it's reasonably priced. Yeah. <laughs> and it's worth it. Which is more than I am. Well. Okay, right. We'll we'll wind that up yeah. and we'll say thank you for listening to this yes. this episode. Yes. And now we turn our attention to the episode fourteen. Yes. And we're just gonna have our traditional silly sketch and we'll mm. say goodbye. Okay. So thank you for listening, everyone. Yeah, See you again you. soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Miss Parker, are you free? At the moment, Mr Trowbridge, yes. Then perhaps you could explain what exactly this empty cat carrier is doing in the middle of the floor. Well, as you is well aware, today is bring your pet to work day, and naturally I bought Martha Cat, so she could see what I get up to during the day. But where precisely is she? She was exploring the delicatessen counter just now when a selection of cheeses caught her eye. I can hardly condone letting your cat just wander willy-nilly, but carry on with your story. She jumped down to grab a portion of Dorset Blue Vinny when the assistant behind the counter startled her, and she took fright. The last I saw, my pussy was making for the exit with a big blue-veined knob clamped between her teeth. That was episode 13 of Round the Archives, starring Lisa Parker and Andrew Trowbridge, with Paul Chandler, Warren Cummings and special guest star John Chalice. On the musical side, you heard Dan Tate and Paul Chandler. The script for Are You Being Served? The Hold Up was by Jeremy Lloyd. And the producer was Martin Shardlow.
Jim Jim Bergerac's car is uh, I, I don't know anything about cars but it's a it's a old purple car <laughs> but nice one <laughs> oh I'm sorry let me see maybe oh, maybe I can find out online hello hello <laughs> I don't know what sort of voice that was <laughs> it was Silly. Silly. Hello and welcome <laughs> to episode 13. I think we should start that again. I think we should start that again. <laughs> <laughs>